Hi, and welcome to part two of my, I still have no idea how many parts I'll need, series on the ABCs for Young Earth Creationists. I left the last episode off at the letter D for Dendrochronology. So now I'll progress on to E for Endogenous Retroviral Markers. ERVs are the classic example, because I had to have one that shows how strong evolution is. We'll start with what e ERVs are. Retroviruses are a class of RNA viruses that essentially integrate their own genetic material into the genetic material of the host organism. When the retroviruses infect germ cells, that is, gametes, their DNA is incorporated into the offspring and will con continue on. That's essentially all they are, just viruses that place markers inside DNA. We can then look for the markers of the ERVs and tell if an organism was infected. Now, it's conceivably possible for the same retrovirus to infect two similar animals, and I've often heard creationists use this to justify why humans and other organisms share the same retroviruses. It makes sense. If they could infect similar organisms, why wouldn't we expect to find the same ERVs in other animals? But creationists tend to ignore one tiny detail. When people say we share markers, they're not just the same sequences of DNA found in two different organisms. It's the same sequence of retroviral DNA found in the same location on the genome. The retroviral DNA has no preferred place to insert itself, considering it's a purely chemical insertion with no intelligence and no way to distinguish between genes. So, finding the same two retroviral markers in the exact same place because two different organisms were infected seems a bit odd. What, then, could explain the matching markers in two different organisms? Well, if one organism was infected with a retrovirus that entered the germ cell, then the offspring will also have the retrovirus. All future offspring, then, would have the same marker. Then, if the offspring branch off from each other, both branches will then show the retrovirus. This is what is meant by the ERVs building a clear nested hierarchy of life. They could have continuously infected separate organisms on numerous occasions in the exact same location with no method to specify where in the genome to be inserted, but it seems remarkably unlikely. After all, just having one matching marker by creationist logic, then each and every kind sharing an ERV must have been infected with the endogenous retrovirus in the exact same place. And that's just to explain a single common marker. If, however, only one organism was infected, and then you follow a branching pattern, what we see now is not only easy to explain, it's expected. Now, it is possible that God simply wanted multiple organisms to share multiple viral DNA sequences in the exact same place that exactly correspond to the nested hierarchy created by conserved genes because um, he thought life's more interesting if all organisms share varying am amounts of viral DNA with each other, but as far as the evidence goes, it's really difficult to say ERVs aren't anything but brilliant evidence for evolution. F for fission track dating. Uranium, as everyone knows, is a radioactive material. When it decays, it spontaneously splits, releasing enough energy to damage some materials. This damage is actually rather large, micrometer sized, so it's e easily visually observed. Knowing the half-life and concentration of the uranium, you can tell the date just by looking at how much damage the uranium has done. The more damage, the longer the crystal has been around for. This only works, of course, after the uranium has been embedded into solid crystals, so fission track dating only tells you how long it's been since the crystal has cooled and hardened. Here's the cool part. Creationists never cease to complain about, well, maybe there's contamination. Solid uranium has a very difficult way of creeping into an already set crystal. In other words, you don't have to worry about uranium getting into or out of solid rock. What about ways to influence the number of fission tracks? Well, those are actually rather fickle things. Turns out that fission tracks are susceptible to heat. Given time and temperature, fission tracks will actually disappear from the crystal lattice. That's the biggest pitfall of fission track dating. Not that it overestimates the age of material, but rather, it underestimates the age. Now, 
Of course, it's possible that God simply put tiny micrometer long damage marks in numerous uranium containing materials because he thought that uranium containing materials really do need more battle scars than are possible within 6,000 years of history or that he gave it the exact appearance of millions of years since the rocks cooled, even though they're really 6,000 years. But at that point, you're arguing the rough equivalent of last Thursdays, and where it really doesn't seem to matter what the evidence says, the evidence is really ignored. Hey, it's possible. But if you want to say the evidence is invalid just because God wanted to make it that way, the evidence is still there. G for granite. My AP chemistry teacher all the way back in high school sent us through hell and back. I will always resent zero period, and though he was quite the devout Christian, you can be sure of one thing. He would never be a young earth creationist. This is because he had a certain love of rocks, in his words, his only friends. Granite is a very hard, tough rock that forms out of igneous rock deep under the crust. It is then brought to the surface as a result of tectonic movement. This process alone takes quite a while for the granite to even surface, but that's not the nail in the coffin for young earth creationism. The neat bit comes from carving the granite. This is Half Dome. It's quite pretty, formed over a long period of time, and was brought to the surface of Yosemite via tectonic activity along the fault lines of California. But what's really interesting is the shape. You've got one side that's very smooth and round, but the other that's a sharp, flat rock. This is an odd phenomenon to be explained by a flood. Why would a global flood shear off one rock face, but leave the rest a very smooth, round dome? Well, half dome. And how could a single event possibly erode a giant chunk of solid, hard granite? Consider for a moment the energy required to take, well, half of the dome off. Wouldn't this event also have been expected to utterly eviscerate all of the smaller rocks in the area? And why is there a U-shaped valley in the first place? Notice there's a flat bottom. This stands in very stark contrast to what you'd expect from flowing water, but it matches very perfectly with glaciation. A slow process of glacial eroding would perfectly explain the valley of solid granite as well as the sheared rock face. We know glaciers can erode rock, and when they do, it forms nice U-shaped valleys, as seen in this picture of Glacier National Park. So these granite monoliths stand in very strong agreement with one expects from an old Earth with tectonic activity and, well, ice, specifically glaciers. A global flood, however, will do very little to explain the patterns we see in granite. Now... It's possible God made the flood selectively shear away the rock face and create a U-shaped valley in a snow-prone area via some magical flood-wielding powers, or even that he made all the granite in its present form without letting the flood do anything at all. But either way, it doesn't change the fact that the granite structures, by all indication, came about, about via a slow process of erosion after surfacing. Anyway, thanks for watching part two. Please feel free to leave any comments or criticism. If I'm right, tell me how much you love me. If I'm wrong, please correct me. I hope to get a third part up eventually. Anyway, thanks very much. Please don't forget to rate, comment, and subscribe.